I'm Joanne Uwe, and I'm the founder of EA Festival, and I wanted to welcome you to edition number three of the festival at Headingham Castle, and I am very excited to, um, to, just, to, to just launch this with Louise Gray, who has been an integral participant in EA Festival since its inception. In fact, we entitled a panel discussion in EA Festival number one, The Ethical Carnivore, which is actually Louise's very first book, and it documents her journey, learning about where her meat comes from, uh, and what she did to prepare for the book, or, or what the substance of the book is her experience over two years of only eating meat that she either found or killed herself. Now, um, she has written a book which is similar in mission, but about a completely different subject, fruits and vegetables. Now, on this note, I also wanted to mention that I was saying that Louise was an integral part to EA Festival. I actually launched a festival in January this year called EA Sustain, in which Louise was a key moderator. And that festival was about environment, culture, and entrepreneurship. And it took place in Colchester at the Contemporary Art Museum, First Sight. As it turned out, um, it was a big success, mainly because there's actually a very big interest in topics about the environment, which are explained to an ordinary layperson. So I invite you to check that out and please save the date uh, in 2024. Now, now we're gonna actually talk about Louise's newest book, Avocado Anxiety, which discusses where our fruit and vegetables come from, some of the most popular and common ones in our fridge and in our kitchens. So, <laughs> Louise, welcome. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming on a, so early on a Saturday morning. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to actually dig right into the book, which is about the fact that actually the, there's no easy answer, there's no black and white algebraic equation, which is going to give the carbon emission breakdown of every food stuff easily. And, and I think the book makes a huge contribution, and I'm sorry, I haven't interviewed you yet, but <laughs> it makes a huge contribution because I think one of the key messages is that this is a nuanced investigation in terms of both conscience and in, and in terms of science. So, and I, and so Louise walks through the carbon emissions of certain vegetables that we eat all the time. So I want to start with um, the avocado. This yeah. seems like the most obvious example. Yeah. So Louise, tell us about how this is the perfect touchstone for the theme of your book. Well, I guess um, one of the reasons um, is because we're eating so many more avocados, but they're seen as something you eat if you're vegan or if you're into clean food and you're very um, conscious of the environment. But then there's been a massive backlash um, against that. I don't know anyone saw, but um, people have been attacked for eating avocados on toast rather than buying a house. You know, it's a sort of typical um, millennials eating avocados and not being serious about the environment. So it seemed to me a touchstone where we're um, anxious about the environment, but we don't know what to do. So I wanted to investigate what the, what the real impact of avocados are on the environment. Okay, so let's actually start out with one of the um, big me measurements, which is um, food miles, yeah. which um, were, were quite a polemic uh, yeah. about 20 years ago. And people started to think, oh my God, I should only be eating locally sourced vegetables and fruits. Now, was that a valid accusation? I mean, about imported vegetables and fruits? Yeah, it's something to be concerned about. And avocado is one of those things. So if you get back to that anxiety, one of the first things people might say is, you know, okay, you're not eating meat um, from somewhere like Essex, but you're eating an avocado that's been shipped um, across the world. And we're all aware of food miles, which is a sort of term that came out um, in the late 90s. And it was about, um, it, and, and it was explaining the number of miles our food has traveled because uh, that's, unsustainable because obviously it causes carbon emissions. So I wanted to dig into that and at each beginning of each chapter I actually put the carbon um, carbon footprint of all each fruit and vegetables, each fruit and vegetable. And that was really interesting because fruit and vegetables like even even avocados have quite a low carbon footprint and I got booed the other day because I was talking to farmers and uh, the carbon footprint of an avocado is 1.6 kilograms of carbon dioxide um, Per, per kilogram of produce. And that's about 
um, beef, even if it's sustainable, is 18 kilograms. So that gives you an idea of how how the how heavy the carbon footprint is of beef. But then where did the water come from for the from the avocado? So it shows you that food miles aren't um, isn't the only consideration when you're talking about the environment. You've got to talk about uh, the social impact, human rights. Uh, which is a concern with avocados and water, which is a concern with avocados, as well as the carbon footprint. Actually, I think it's important to um, break out the amount of carbon emissions from air freighting vegetables, because yeah. I think one of the key missions of this session is also to illuminate your shopping trip to the grocery store. Yeah. So. Um, do you and and I start the, the book in, 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 a, in a supermarket with my young child, feeling anxious, not knowing where my fruit and veg is from. And, um, and um, food, food miles are something to be concerned about. So um, air freight will massively increase um, the carbon, carbon footprint. So um, asparagus from Peru, if you bought it now, obviously you can probably just about buy it in the UK now, but, you can, but if you're buying it from Peru, it would be up there with beef. So it's un understanding that, like how the massive impact of air freight. Having said that, if you drove to the supermarket rather than took a bicycle, or if you went on a short haul flight, then that would be a bigger impact. So it's understanding the nuances of where carbon. Now I, I want to. Um, you actually pointed out repeatedly in the book yeah. that it's actually our domestic road transport of vegetables, yeah. which is as a proportion of overall emissions caused by the food industry or, or food just food industry. Um, is that, that's actually three quarters of carbon emissions. It's actually us shipping food by truck within the UK and also driving to the grocery store, which has massively increased in recent decades. However, <laughs> also to just, no, because I think this is really important to make sure like some basic um, information is passed during the session. However, as you said, air shipping a fruit or vegetable compared to sending it by sea container is 177 times more intense in carbon um, uh, emissions. So that, that's... Yeah, and it can be massively confusing, but a really easy way of think about it, I think, is if you're looking at your, it, it's your shopping basket rather than your individual carbon footprint is about much bigger things, but your individual shopping basket and a way to bring that down is to avoid air freight or minimize yes, it. But I yes, wouldn't you say, should still try to cut that. Yeah, but I wouldn't yeah. say take it away completely because there are farmers in Africa and Peru mm -hmm. and other places who uh, are developing much quicker, sending their children to school because they're part of export horticulture. And our government is giving money to that to try and um, help economic development in Africa. And Oxfam and uh, lots of other charities support that. So again, <laughs> every time I say something simple, I complicate it. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, the, in the case of Af Africa, yeah. the tiny fraction which is exported to the UK can actually sustain their agricultural economy because they actually consume yeah. the vast proportion of what's grown. So we're helping these countries, these least, less developed nations. Now, yeah. I want to also go back to the water footprint because yes. one of the most interesting findings in, that I uh, derived from the book was also that the water f footprint varies enormously depending on how water stressed the country is. Yeah. So talk about that. Well, that's really interesting because I've recently been looking into that more. So um, let's take avocados. And uh, most avocados in this country are from Peru. And um, they're being, uh, they are being irrigated um, f f from, the, um, from the Amazon, which would be going to the sea anyway. So it's not too much of a problem. In Chile, it's a massive problem because it's coming from aquifers, which are drying out. But they're actually looking... Avocados is still exploding, even... It's not a bad thing. Like I don't, I'm not against avocados in the book, um, and even um, lots of people will be eating more, so they're going to increase more. And they're now growing more in places like Colombia and Kenya, where there's natural rainfall. And that's the point. Like in Spain and Morocco, you're you're using water from irrigation, so then it becomes um, more of a concern because um, what happens to the communities that also need that water? Okay, so. Also, this is related to the issue of how tomatoes are grown. This is actually yeah. also another um, another vegetable which has which, which is actually quite complex, but would surprise you in the conclusions that, that Louise reached. So tell us about well, so tomatoes, 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 tomatoes. Sorry, <laughs> tomato, tomato. Um, they can um, 
it, so tomato you might remember the tomato shortage earlier in the year so um which is about um the a fact we're not actually maybe investing enough in growing our own tomatoes here so gr- tomatoes grown here um will probably have a higher footprint at certain times of year because uh we have to heat the greenhouses not this time of year um compared to if you were shipping them from Spain um and well driving them uh, because they're grown outdoors and they don't need to have heated greenhouses but again then you be the water in this country is coming from the rainwater it's not a problem whereas in Spain again it's an issue because it's it's um it's using water from aquifers so tomatoes i guess tomatoes are a good um it's good That's to eat them in the example. uk um seasonally but out of season if you're thinking about carbon it's it it would be better to take them from Spain um, to import them from Spain. Okay, so this but they is, don't taste as good. Okay, this is like very so if you're a consumer as yeah. you can see, I mean and by the way, do buy the book because yeah. it does deal with the most common vegetables in your yeah. fridge and actually really could inform your purchasing decisions. Um now what about the state of licensing? There's been a lot of discussion or attempts to come up with some kind of carbon um measurement system which consumers could easily could read like a rosette or something like that. What's this, yeah. what is the yeah. state of play so on I that? So I guess like already the audience probably thinking oh it's all too confusing. Um we need a label. And there are there have been labels um uh considered one is called the omni label and it's like a flower and then you'd have a petal um for um a water footprint so you'd know how bad it was for using water and you'd have a petal for carbon footprint and a petal for nutrition. Um it's a nice idea but I don't personally think it's ever going to take on. In fact, they've already done carbon footprints on Walkers Crisps and Pepsi Cola a few years ago but nobody even noticed because nobody's looking at their at the Pepsi Cola and things were trying to be um to tackle climate change in that way but it doesn't really work. So really those labels are about the producers and I'm aware I'm in a East Anglian audience there'll be farmers in the audience you know already farmers are measuring carbon on farm and uh, developing ways to reduce carbon so I actually think it'll be more about the production of food um and the consumer won't have to think about it too much because there is too much to think about and in the book I can't give de- definite answers but I have tried to tell stories so that it can give you when you have a story inside you it makes it easier to make decisions because you understand um the whole the whole journey of a tomato or avocado so so i feel like labels labels are important but i think it's going to be more about the retailers and the farmers and the producers because it can't all be on the consumer yes okay great now um so some of the common sense things that come to mind which you could do besides but besides consolidating your groceries is mm-hmm. and and eating less beef um and also i think i want to point out that air freighted imported beef is has a footprint of 55 kilograms of okay, carbon emissions it can emissions. be 84 or something well, yeah. but i mean something like but, yeah, very but high but also got to point out that this is a really new science like no one's really decided on how it works yet and uh and it can you know you can pick holes in it you know but but british so, grass fed beef 18. is is a <laughs> tiny fraction of that so yeah. i think like let's also emphasize the importance of be, trying to eat as locally as possible and on that note I, and because you tell stories i think so eating locally and that's something that ea sustain really tries to encourage more of um tell us about the fife diet there was actually a yes. man who pioneered a diet where he, did, he 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 made this huge effort to eat within how many miles of where he lived 100 100 miles okay and is, was it practical how did that yeah, turn and, out yeah and that, that actually happened it was in it was in the US as well it's called the 100 mile diet and it was massively popular it became like the biggest uh food movement in Europe um um about you know 15 years ago and he actually changed it to 80 20 um because you know coffee and chocolate and things like that he still wanted to have that and lots of people signed up and it was really popular but ultimately it didn't last forever because i think we have such busy lives and i've interviewed him and he, one of the things he said you know you couldn't just bung on pasta and pesto for the kids you had to think much earlier on about oh you know it's a uh, it's celeriac in season so i'm going to have to prep that you know it is in season and it is local and delicious but i need time to make that delicious to get my kids to eat it um but it the interesting thing was the feedback he got from the five diet 
And it kept on going because through it, there were community farms set up and community meals and things like that. The pe thing that people most came back with was how it made them feel, that they felt more in connection with their landscape, with the farmers around them. So loads of positive com things come from eating locally. But I personally think it's okay to, to, to eat from you know a wider area because because um, we lead modern because, lives. Well, we live. We, yeah, we live modern lives, but but we should be becoming more sustain, um, more self sufficient. The government are talking about it at the moment because we've we, we're not as self sufficient perhaps as we could be, and we could be growing more fruit and veg in the UK, which would be good for our farming, good for our environment, and you know, good good for prices and um, um, nutrition. Okay. So I think that also that's one of the themes of your book, actually, that there can't be dogmatic or binary or radical in the change in habits that we have to we find the right balance for ourselves personally. And I think um, that's just because we all eat and I eat and you can't you can't you can't give that message unless you're a, a saint yourself, which I'm not. <laughs> you were when you were the ethical carnivore. Yeah, that was easier. No longer. Now she's yeah. a mom. <laughs> um, now, talking about the other side of the carbon equation, because we've been talking about the supply side to a large extent, um, I, I don't, probably unbeknownst to many of you, the amount of carbon emissions attributable to wasted food, however, is gigantic. Yeah. So, Louise, tell us about the, yeah, so the after, quantum if, of that if problem. Really, if you're really anxious, um, and this is where the, food, the, the book starts off, about where your food comes from and the climate impact. And, you know, if you're looking at the news at the moment and seeing where we're heading with climate change, it's terrifying towards four degrees. And, you've, you know, it's about energy and transport and then food. Um, reducing meat and then after, uh, uh, under that is food waste and food waste is com is temp uh, um, in the carbon emissions from the food system is 10 percent of uh, man-made greenhouse gas emissions so it's huge if it were a country it would be third after the us and china um, and there are so many ways we can cut it through production and also in our homes so so food, it, that's the next thing. If you really want to cut your carbon emissions, it's about reducing food waste. Okay. I want to add two other facts from Louise's book. <laughs> that we throw away a third of the food that we produce and according to Project Drawdown, which is an important um, carbon emission proposal from the, from the US, food waste would be reducing it or cutting it would be the number one solution to the climate crisis above electric cars, solar power, and plant-based diets. Okay, so I want to flag this to all of you because actually, whereas you think, oh my God, I can't buy local all the time, I'm not going to just eat seasonal food, when you think about the fact that most food waste is taking place domestically um, at home and that in fact it happens it, it, to a disproportionately higher degree in more affluent um, uh, households, which is all of you guys. Probably. <laughs> is this actually something where you could make a significant dent in your carbon footprint? Where, yeah. Whereas the other measures, this is actually very common sense and practical. Um, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> and yet, we continue to we continue to buy too much food. Um, now, tell us about carrots because this, the the chapter dedicated to this subject in Louise's books is about carrots. I've actually made some wonky carrot biscuits that you can buy at the, have at the bookshop because I've, there's small recipes in the book, but. Um, yeah, I went to a carrot factory to see see them all, you know, all the all the the wonky ones being spat out the side. And in that in that case, they're making it into baby food. But up to forty percent of uh, wonky or misshapen fruit and veg can be rejected, and there's no reason for that. It could be used in um, in 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 uh, well in carrot battens. They're making them into into baby food, and it's all part of talking about circular economies. And I'm really aware of like, I think when the first EA Sustain, we talked about systems thinking and um, it can, you can get really excited about it, but it's really hard to explain to people um, because it's all about how everything interconnects. But um, food, really reducing food waste is about a circular economy. And if you think about the economy as, um, as a straight line and things going at the bin at the end, and it doesn't need to, it can come back in, you know, just making sure that food waste goes back in as another food product or given to pigs or given uh, to, 
um, humans as part of redistribution, which has got issues you can talk about, um, or ultimately um, to make uh, methane, um, to make methane um, in anaerobic digesting units, of which in Wales, everyone has, um, everyone has a food waste um, bin and 100% uh, of their food waste is recycled. But in England, that's pretty low because people don't want to use slot buckets, which is really ridiculous. I think it'll be like glass recycling in the future. You won't believe that people aren't recycling their food waste because we can make energy from it. That's a, one of the best chapters, um, how, to, how to literally cut food waste to zero is actually not a ridiculous goal. Um, now we're going to shift gears. Okay. <laughs> the first part of the discussion was about mitigation of carbon emissions in the food industry. Um, and then I, I personally found that the most interesting chapter in the book possibly is the one about bananas. Because I think bananas is one of our go-to fruits. It's our most and popular we, fruit. It's, it's, a gigantic, it's of gigantic importance globally. And just I think it's also one of those fruits, for whatever reason, we environmentalists, at least in my experience, because I wasn't focused on this, just never were aware of how they're, they were the leading edge of industrialized food production historically. So, Louise, tell us about that. I guess I mean, we, that's because of the history of bananas, because... Um, at the turn of the last century, you know, they they, they discovered uh, that you could grow bananas on, you know, cut down rainforests so you have massively nutri uh, nutritious land, grow potato um, bananas on scale, and then they ripen in exactly seven days, so then they had refrigerated ships. And within a few years, it became the most popular fruit in America, and people got very rich. And whole governments like um, uh, Guatemala, um were, were were run by people who who uh, were running these banana plantations, um, and it's quite interesting because that hadn't really happened with fruit and veg before. It's much more local. You know, you buy apples locally, and then suddenly it was um, uh, mass production. And with it came all those problems with match. Well, the benefits, I guess, in the I should say first of all, because we had this cheap exotic fruit and we love it, but then also. Um, the environmental impacts of cutting down rainforests, obviously, or the, and, um, and the human cost of the cheap labor needed, and the environmental impact, which continues because the bananas are all um, a monoculture, and so they all, if, if they get sick, um, well, if, if, if a disease starts, um, then they all get it. So it uses a lot of chemicals still to this day. So they're quite a good example of, oh, yes. of I guess, capitalism. <laughs> Maybe the they're, book, they're everything comes example. down to the book of cap how capitalism has, yeah. has affected uh, the fruit and veg trade. But a, uh, but a pandemic, I mean, I think that one of the big themes of the book is yeah. that the reliance of industrial food production on only a few species and in some time, sometimes only one core golden species per category means that they're susceptible to things like pandemics, literally, which could wipe them out. And in this case, 400 million people around the world either yeah. eat bananas, or depend on the income and nutrition is what you yeah. said. Yeah, but, but it was really interesting. When I was writing that, it was a pandemic. It was a lockdown. I remember interviewing this scientist and he was explaining what's happening with, um, with bananas. And he was saying, you know, it's this disease and we don't know where it's come from and, and it moves invisibly and everything's going to be wiped out. And I was sitting there like unable to leave the house. Thinking, oh my God, <laughs> it's a pandemic. And he was like, yeah, it's a banana pandemic. And he'd written his... Um, his thesis on it. And he's a wonderful, passionate banana scientist um, who has had a child recently and dresses him up as a banana. But that's, that's, <laughs> that's well, all these scientists are really oh eccentric, gosh. interesting people. But um, something that someone said to me recently, really great advice before doing book festivals and stuff is I don't know what the question is, but the answer is diversity. And you said the book is often talking about monocultures and things like that and industrial food. And it's not a like I said at the beginning, it's not bad that we have cheap food produced en masse, um, but bringing more diversity in will solve so many of our problems in terms of the environment and health. So diversity, that's my answer. <laughs> now, uh, one of the other deleterious consequences of industrialized food production is on soil health. And on that note, yeah. I want to also mention that bananas are the number one user of pesticides of all crops in the world, according to one of the studies that Louise quoted. Um, but let's talk about soil health. And, yeah. and that was a huge, a huge subject. Huge, and, and, and I managed to get that into, yeah, 
10,000 words. I don't know how, because it just went on and on and on. Because really, all the chapters are about soil, because it's where everything starts. And looking after our soil um, will is, is the most important thing we can do for for um, our food production. And that chapter, every chapter, the, it, the, the theme is linked to the fruit or vegetable. And I go through potatoes, because... Um, that's a that's a massively intensive crop, relatively speaking, in in the UK, and um, and we've had to learn to protect to far, potato farmers now in East Anglia are on a much longer rotation. They're putting much more organic matter into the soil. They're using technology like uh, GPS systems uh, to reduce water irrigation, even flattening the land to stop. Um, um, I was um, getting the train through the fens looking at it um, yesterday. So protecting the soil is a huge part of how we're going to continue to feed ourselves without destroying the planet, basically. Okay, so a lot of people in this room don't know about regenerative agriculture. So just yeah. you now, we can't get into a huge discussion, but just in a very quick snapshot or just like a couple... Well, that's a challenge with... Couple, a, potted, a potted summary of what it entails to regenerate soil health, just so that... Because we can't just... Yeah, I guess it's... What, guess, what, is, I mean, what does that require? Well... Um, it requires, um, well, in some, in some cases it's no dig agriculture, but you've obviously got to dig it up with potatoes, though there are, um, there are, um, there are experiments with uh, no dig potatoes that has, it has been done. Um, but regenerative agriculture, it still uses, it's not like organic because it still uses glyphosate, uses chemicals, but it puts at the bottom, it puts at the heart the, um, the health of the soil and uh, improving the health of the soil largely through organic means like um, putting introducing organic matter, even introducing um, bacterias, and um, and producing it with less less chemicals, yeah, and and more more technology as well. Now on the a bit like okay, so you 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 propose a kind of a mixed farming a mi yeah. mixed model, and I wanted to cite the example of the salad greens in your book, yeah. where Louise visited the largest producer of salad greens in the UK. In Norfolk. Yeah. Maybe. Tell us about that because it was astonishing that they had what was it, the highest density of nightingale nightingales? Or yeah, something? yeah, nightingale they did. Breeding? Like the nightingales are coming back. So I guess the example there was um, for a book like this that you think your your um, the answer is going to be bio organic, and um, organic farms definitely have more biodiversity on them. That's a that's a fact. Um, but whether whether it's uh, I haven't seen any much peer reviewed evidence about whether it's better for you. And there is a question over whether we can whether it can feed enough people affordably enough. So I never came to the conclusion I was going to write a chapter saying everyone should eat organic. For me, it's more about a mixed picture where uh, there is some intensive farming. But then you as a consequence of having intensive farming on some land, you can rewild other areas of land and then you need agro agroecological farms certainly or organic farms where you see that um, um, diversity and nightingales are a really good example because it's a it's not a farmland bird but it perhaps should be that has massively plummeted like in my lifetime 50 percent of farmland birds uh, well the the population of 50 of farmland birds in my lifetime has gone down by 50%. I always remember interviewing someone from the RSPB about lapwings, and he's saying, haven't you ever seen one? And I was like, no. And I grew up in Essex on a farm, and he'd, he'd grown up in a similar area, and, um, and, and they'd been around. So um, that is because of how we farm the land. But the interesting thing about nightingales is they're coming back in certain areas, and um, uh, because of... Um, hedgerows and you know um the way thing um lettuce is being farmed they're putting in um hedgerows and ditches and was this uh, a cheese fresh yeah a cheese fresh yeah. and they've yeah. and, the, and the nightingales have come back and they're actually very healthy and that it's one of the largest um other uh, one of the largest um breeding populations other than where land has been rewilded and i just thought it was a really nice example because it shows that we can have wildlife and food because we need to have wildlife and food i wanted to just point out how gigantic this farm is um it's well they're, they're a huge company they've actually yeah. got more land in spain that's where you're your, okay yeah. there you go yeah because you know, your, your tomatoes and cucumbers and lettuce come from and but we yeah. eat 10 to 15 million heads of lettuce in the uk per week and this company g's fresh 
supplies 65% of it. So I think the, the, the reason yeah. I think it was such an amazing example is because it, it was almost a paragon of industrial scale farming because they had this yeah. amazing uh, breeding density of the nightingale. And obviously you described that. So, yeah. and so, I mean, was that your takeaway that it is possible to do farming on such a vast scale like, did you think that this is where that this is the think, direction of travel was good? But what was your takeaway from just visiting? Them? I guess I kind of have to come back to how I eat and I pick up a bag of lettuce. So I'm not going to criticize other people uh, for doing that. And that comes from an industrial uh, production. If you've ever tried to grow lettuce, like imagine it's, it's quite awful. hard. It's really hard, right? Like it's, it's eaten by everything. And yet you go to the fens and there are just acres and acres of perfect lettuce. I mean, how is that being produced and 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 it has got and it has got quite intense it is intensive use of chemicals I go through the book like some of the chapters when I'm writing about the chemicals on our fruit and veg it it's really shocking you think my god what like so I think with potatoes you know a tractor goes in up to 20 times putting on fungicides and all these different kind of chemicals but that's the fact of our of our food production and I personally I think it has to I can't see a world where we're all eating um, organic in the short term, but I feel like we could be um, producing um, food in a more environmentally friendly way. I think you need to talk to people like G's Fresh who can produce food intensively, um, but also introduce wildlife into their farms, not discount them. I think basically. we should go on a tour. I yeah, think absolutely. Staying tour with the Louise and Jesus. Yeah, Fresh. yeah, yeah. They might be up for that. No, I'd be up for doing that yeah, with you. Yeah. We should do that with the Food Museum. By the way, we're going to be yeah. doing events with the Food Museum EA Festival. On that note, yeah. Um, now it's actually time for Q and A, but I'm going to eat into that because one last point. Yeah. Make this quickly. Is the healing power of fruits and vegetables? So talk about that. About how we've bred. That sounds a bit out. It, that sounds a bit like crazy, but actually. When you really get into writing about food and talking about food, you do feel quite evangelical about it, about how many problems could be solved in our society um, by, by fruit and vegetables. Like, I've been doing a lot of talks with Kimberly Wilson, who's written a book about unprocessed foods, and it's a fact that if you had a better diet in prisons, it would reduce violence by 30%, but we don't do it. And then the um, how good good food makes people more fruit and vegetables is key to our health and not just our physical health um, but our mental health if we feel better and I talk about foraging and gardening and the impact that has on your mental health just being out in nature so um, it yeah it could it and schools it would solve a lot of problems to eat more fruit and vegetables it sounds a ridiculous statement to make but it's true <laughs> Okay, now we're going to take some questions from the audience. This lady here. I'm going to oh. pretend that I don't know she's Louise's sister. In law. In law, um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Louise, in the Thanks, chapter Claude. about potatoes, oh, yeah. you come up with a really good um, analogy that Thorpe said about. Oh, yeah. Can you the tell apple. us? Yeah. Can you oh, tell us about that? Well, I should have an apple on me. Um, it was a farmer I interviewed and um, he goes into schools with an apple and explains to them, and I, I'll go this one's over in the book, but he explains to them that I think, I have, might have to look at the book, but most of the world is oceans, obviously. Ah, here we go. Right. Okay. Give me the book. I can oh, have sorry, to get the sorry. stats there right. Go. There you go. Got it. Sorry. I could even I like use a knife and fork. Thorpe, the, the farmer should be doing this. But what's so great about the farmer who does this, he's usually doing it with school children, but he treated me like a school child, which is not a bad thing because we don't, we don't know this fact. But, um, but basically, um, um, of, right, here we are. So a three quarters of the world is oceans. Then half of that land is inhospitable places like polar, um, like mountains. Um, a, an eighth of that um, uh, is used to build cities or motorways. Um, and you're left with, I can't get into this, but basically you're left with a tiny bit of apple skin. That's the soil that we use to um, farm our food. And it is reducing. There's been studies that show we could have 
60 harvests left, 60 years of harvest left, which isn't is, isn't true for all soils, but certainly in some places. So it was a really good illustration of how important soil is um, to, uh, to, to the survival of humankind. And there's been like, it's really interesting, like you think soil's really boring, but there's really cool. There's um, a documentary on Netflix with Woody Harrelson. There's lots of really, it, there's, there's another film coming out about soil. It's, um, it's key to everything. We need, we, need a film, sure we need a film called Soil is Sexy or yeah, something like that. It's, it's being made. Oh, good. Seriously, I'll tweet good. that after. I'm going to buy the T-shirt for sure. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? We can take one more question from down the row. Uh, thank you. Um, Louise, I find it all quite overwhelming. Yeah. And that's probably just my ignorance and really taking time. No, at all. That's to... what avocado, that's why the title, because yeah. that's how we all feel, I and think. It, and, it, and it does. It's kind of, you know, what can I do? Yeah. Where I think depending on the age of the audience, which doesn't look, you know, looks similar to mine, where it's probably going to be my, child, my sister's children's future that you know everyone yeah. always talks about and the pandemic taught us supply chain we have to become more sustainable yeah there will be another global pandemic but even even without the pandemic the, the tomato shortage recently and that exactly. was climate change that's Look not even our, the pandemic that's yeah um, that's basically um the weather in northern africa and spain which we rely which is we rely on for our fruit and veg. Yeah, and I think you've said so many things that are alarming that we generally throw away a third of our food. Yeah. And I've worked in environments most of my career of extreme poverty and water scarcity yeah. in the Middle East. And then on the flip side, now working in a country where budget is no issue and the pace and scale of, of development and sustainability and green is just yeah. beyond our wildest imagination and Where's that's that? in Saudi Arabia yeah so um Iraq just north of that water yeah. scarcity extreme poverty and yeah. then vision 2030 in Saudi where it's it, it is it's off the scale yeah bringing it closer to home though where it's the most enormous topic but what can we do as individuals? What part can we play? Um, which is, is probably covered in your book, but I think bringing it down to that micro, macro sort of level yeah. of what's in our fridge, where do we buy from? I love the support, the thought of supporting locally. You know, why wouldn't you? But not everyone can afford that. Yeah. You know, the, the average individual, um, one can they understand the messaging I struggle, how are we messaging it, and bring it into education of the children at a really young age, surely is a huge responsibility. So what's the point and what's my question? Um, <laughs> well, I think, I think, <laughs> is I think what, yeah. yes, thank you. Uh, what can we do as individuals to play our part? Yeah, I think um, we've already mentioned about Eating well, my first book was about eating less meat because of the carbon. Um, because and if we want to, if, if we want to, like lots of in an audience like this, we want to invest in good meat, but you know, you need to spend more money, so then you need to eat less to be able to afford that. And we talked about food waste, those are the two sort of carbon ones. And then one we haven't talked about is plant protein. And uh, um, other than eating more fruit and veg, you can get quite evangelical about pulses. about um, broad beans and pulses, not just for us to eat, but for animals to eat, us growing it here rather than importing it from um, South America. And that's, um, it's a good, um, it fixes nitrogen, so it means less chemicals. Um, so more plant proteins. And you talked about, um, like, local, local is something I just hesitate with because I don't, like, I don't feel like, uh, the five diet is realistic but I do think uh, like veg boxes it's really hard isn't it because when you're traveling you I can seldom do it when I'm traveling but that's a really easy way and I do think like where you can buying local is um, not necessarily um, more affordable but really fun so local and then diversity I talked about that where, like the the chapter on apples is about diversity and it's not just about 
our own gut microbiome, which benefits from biodiversity, and farmers who benefit from diversity because the more diversity on farms, they can, it helps with reducing chemicals and stuff. Um, but in, um, in the apple chapter, it's about um, diversity as a way of uh, surviving climate change. There's really interesting studies happening in Kent at the moment, developing apples that are going to be able to withstand our climate. But the genetics might be in some of the apple trees in the orchards we have, and also the wildlife that lives in orchards. So diversity um, is another one. And then on on um, on human rights and stuff, I do think fair trade. I do think it's a really it's not perfect, but um, like I said, the biggest issue for me in bananas is how people are treated. And fair trade is a little bit more expensive. And then I suppose the final thing is about we do have to spend just a little bit more money um, for on fair trade, on local fruit and veg. Yeah. That's, that's something I don't often say, actually, but I realise maybe I am saying that. It's about a little bit about cost. But stories. Don't be anxious about it. Read books. Enjoy it. Think about stories, because I think you, if you're looking for answers, I think you might go mad. <laughs> okay. Well, nonetheless, this book has a lot of great answers, I think, and we, I hope you got some excellent takeaways. I did. This is actually a very easy and f fun read. And Louise is going to be available to sign her book With as biscuits. well at the Red Lion <laughs> Books table. Um, and I also wanted to so thank you, Louise. And thank you to Thanks, Fennec, everyone. who was the sponsor of this session. <laughs> okay.